Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Campus Safety Voices. I'm Robin Hattersley, Editor-in-Chief of Campus Safety. With all of the security, safety, and climate change challenges facing our nation today, it behooves schools, institutions of higher education, and healthcare facilities, as well as many other types of organizations, to review and update their approaches to public safety, emergency management, energy savings, and sustainability. It's even better if they can address all these challenges with one solution. One highly effective way to address these concerns is security glazing installed on windows and other types of glass openings. To find out about the benefits of security glazing, I interviewed National Glazing Solutions CEO, James Beal. In our interview, James discussed how this solution can help prevent or at least mitigate security incidents involving after shooters, bomb blasts, and riots, as well as mitigate damage from high winds and earthquakes. Additionally, depending on the glazing solution installed, it can help reduce energy costs. So with that, here's my interview with James Beal. Enjoy the show. Be sure to subscribe to Campus Safety's YouTube channel and like or leave a comment on our videos. Or subscribe to our Campus Safety Voices podcast on Apple and Spotify and leave a review. So James, why do campuses need to update their approaches to safety and security right now? Well, you know, outside of the obvious stuff we see on television and all all of the, you know, the negative things that are going on out there in way of civil unrest and, and you know, um, now we've got homegrown terrorism threats, right, that are, that are going on for blast. Um, this, is, this is an issue where we now need to look at perimeter security and really the Achilles heel of perimeter security is the glazing, no matter what building type it is, whether that's a federal building, um, whether that's a K through 12 building um, and, and hardening the glazing is really a, 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 you know, one step in a comprehensive approach to hardening your building. And we're not just talking about K through 12, but we're talking about a whole range of buildings, right? Oh, hundred percent. I mean, you know, everything from your corporate uh, headquarters, office space, anywhere, uh, any building that has a commercial building that's in a high traffic area or, uh, you know, a city center somewhere there where there might be, you know, random acts of violence or vandalism or, or looting or, or anything along or a blast. If you're near a, a, a public transit um, center, if you're near, um, you know, a, a chemical plant, there could be a petrochemical blast. If you're um, in a hurricane uh, storm zone, you know, or, or tornado alley, anywhere where there's potential for high winds, uh, natural disasters, uh, blasts, civil unrest, you know, what, what we call human assisted breach, things, things of those nature, um, you, then you have a need to secure your building against those, those events. Now, I know that NGS conducted a survey on the safety and security of windows and other glass openings on campuses early this year. What did you guys find out? So that's a great question. Um, we got a lot of great feedback and, and it probably won't surprise you that a lot of that is in line with kind of what we we understand to be uh, the sentiment out there in the in the uh, in the industry in various segments, actually government, uh, K through 12 uh, uh, commercial uh, property. Um, and, and really, it's the glass is destined to fail. Most most people don't have a confidence level that they have a secure enough uh, glazing profile. Um, a lot of them don't know what type of glazing or glass they have, which which is a problem because that's that's a component of your security. Um, and the first responders are not enough. So you know, you know, when we talk to people and we you know we we try to understand, you know, what do they need? What are their what's the risk? And what are they trying to protect against? And and you know, and I'll pick on K through twelve. But if you go to K through twelve and you say, okay, well. It, it, for example, in the case of Uvalde, they had police on campus within three minutes. I think it's the report, three to four minutes. OK, um, so the response time was somewhat adequate, but it's what happened when they got there. So the question is, are you relying on the response time? And if you are, then you you want to have a, a slightly different uh, different posture than if you're not relying on the response time. And, and if you want to absolutely keep people out um, versus uh, versus slow them down. Um, the other the other uh, finding was that uh, the natural disasters are a growing concern, as they should be, right? So right now we see that the uh, hurricane season has been extended. It starts earlier in the year, and 
Um, and this is, this is, you know, should not surprise anybody. I mean, look at the West Coast, look at the drought that they're in out there, right? Like Lake Mead is disappearing, um, literally. It's almost a Deadpool status. Um, and so, you know, fires, a lot of people don't realize this, but like in California, where they have these wildfires and they're just raging out of control, they create 100 mile an hour wind gusts. Okay, so you may not be damaged by the fire itself, but the winds associated with those fires when they when the, when they get out of control. Fire natives, right? Yeah, That's fire natives. I mean, they, they, they can they can literally take a side of a building down, the wind knock the windows out, cause you know high winds from a thunderstorm or a hurricane or you know airborne debris. You know, there's there's so many different things that um, that are are problematic and more problematic today than they were even five years ago. And that's climate's more problematic. Let's call it the socio-political environment is more problematic, right? The, the what's going on. And so, <clears throat> you know, if we weren't thinking about it five years ago as the, the, to the extent that we are now, we certainly are now. And, and this survey illustrates that people are now looking at it and saying security professionals specifically and saying, oh my gosh, I, I either, don't have a, a secure enough profile on my glazing, or I don't know what I have on my glazing, which in and of itself is a problem, right? So it's probably worse. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it really is. And it's like, well, how do I, you know, um, it, you know, you, you, how do you, you know, how do you soup up a car, you know, to use the analogy, if you don't know if you have a, a four cylinder or a V8, right? So you, you got you to have to understand what you've got to work with a baseline, if you will. Um, and that's kind of where you need to, you need to call in, a, a, you know, an, an expert to help you, you know, understand what your existing glazing profile is and, and, and what options you have to, to achieve the kind of performance that you need um, for the profile of building you have. Do you have students in there? Do you have sensitive government activities in there? Do you have, you know, uh, are there police or, or first responders in there? Because believe it or not, hospitals, uh, especially trauma centers, they have a security profile because they're considered soft targets, right? Um, and so there's a there's a whole water authorities. I mean, you can go on and on and on and on. Um, and everybody has a need essentially in the commercial and government space on some level to to make sure that they they have a uh, um, I would say a a elevated posture security posture these days. Now, you touched on this a little bit, but how can security glazing help address these challenges? So, you know, let's talk about bombs and shooters and riot prevention and, and mitigation first and foremost. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, we'll, we'll, you know, talking about bombs, um, most people may not know this, but in a bomb blast, the majority of injur injuries are caused by flying glass. OK, so security film was actually originally designed. Um, as a retrofit to glazing, and it's called fragmentation retention. So the, so the polyester and the adhesive hold the glass in place from becoming airborne and thereby, you know, stopping those shards from becoming missiles, right? And, and if you look at the government has a blast criteria, performance criteria for their windows and their envelope, and part of that criteria is, is to demonstrate the, the, the glass in the event of a certain size bomb and, and pressure wave will only debris will the debris field will only be a certain arc and and the film is a component in 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 achieving that and if you look at the marathon or excuse me the Boston City Marathon and you looked at the sidewalk with all the blood on it it's a little bit grotesque but that was all from flying glass right from all the windows that were blown out and so the the retrofitting the glass with a, a security film essentially will 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 improve that glazing profile from deadly potentially to you know to low hazard low level hazard and that is you know by keeping that glass in place think like a windshield on a car right kind of keeps it in place um and then for, in terms of other events well if you if you think about keeping that glass in place now if you anchor that glass and you and you structurally adhere it to the to the frame assuming you have a, a suitable framing system to do that um and then you are protecting against that glass being dislodged in the event of call it a storm event, high wind, or uh, a, a, you know somebody trying to break in a forced entry event, an active shooter forced entry event. So they shoot the glass out, and they're trying to actually get into the building. And what are you trying to do? You're trying to slow them down or stop them. And so if you're slowing them down, security film is a great solution for that. There are other solutions that are. Uh, access denial. So you physical window shields in front of the window that are polycarbonate and that are rated that they just can't get through. Um, and then there's ballistic glazing and ballistic glazing 
um, can come in the form of polycarbonate or polycarbonate clad glass polycarbonate. And then that now you're looking for exactly as it says, um, stopping bullets, right? Um, and then to, to what degree are you stopping a handgun versus a long rifle versus a semi-automatic rifle? Um, there are, you know, different gr uh, grain weights for the bullets and things like that. It gets very technical, but in essence, we look at it in three simple uh, terms. Are you looking for delay, denial, or ballistic? Those are the three things that you really want to look at when you're talking about securing glazing on a building. And, and what's going to drive that answer is going to be what's the, what's the threat that you're trying to, you know, you're trying to manage the risk um, and what, how much money do you have to work with, right? Because, um, you know, in an active shooter scenario, it may not make sense, for example, to put ballistic glazing everywhere you have a window because of the cost and because of the actual structural issues, which are going to drive cost. And so there you would look at um, either a delay or a denial. In other words, you know you're not going to stop the bullet, but as long as you keep the bad guy or gal, for that matter, outside, then they can't get in and, and you know, wreak havoc inside a building. Um, and so, so trying to keep them outside is really what you're trying to do. Delay them, deny them. And then if you're trying to stop the bullets um, it, and where you may have a more sensitive location, or a higher risk location, maybe you've had a specific threat or something like that, then you would want to go to a, a ballistic because with ballistic, you get the access denial as well on the ballistic windows. Let's talk a little bit more about uh, severe weather, fires, seismic protection, explosion, like, you know, you've got your local power plant or, or hazmat incident that, you know, happens across the street. How can window glazing and security glazing uh, mitigate or prevent, well, maybe not prevent, but mitigate those kinds of um, situations? Yeah, well, so, so again, when you when you have your, in your example of a, a power plant or something like that, you know, they each have different um, sort of threat assessments by Homeland Security. And, um, and one of them is, you know, you wanna, you wanna prevent people from, from easily accessing or gaining access to those properties. And so again, the same, the, the delay and the denial solutions are going to work in that in that situation because if you have an active guard presence on property as you would in a, a utility situation, um, then you want to delay them so until somebody can respond to the to the breach or the event. Um, and and as the 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 location gets more secure, i.e., like maybe a military base or something along those lines, maybe you want to go to more of a, a, a denial type situation. Um, yeah. You may not go right to a ballistic, but you'd want to go to a denial. And by the way, the denial uh, solutions are really good um, options for mitigating uh, damage from high winds and storms like hurricanes. So, for example, riot glass has been has been uh, tested to meet uh, Miami-Dade large missile uh, impact, uh, which is pretty impressive. So, so there's a good that's a good solution there. And the and the security films have been tested for small missile impact. You can't sell them in the state of Florida. Um, as and, and nor should you sell any of these products as hurricane mitigation because if a Cat Five comes rolling in, the whole building goes down, right? Yeah. So, so you're, you're really not you know, that. That's really um, disingenuous to to promote a window solution as a solve for hurricanes, right? Because you're only as good as your weakest link, um, and if you have a, a what we call a brick and stick building, you know, then then the stick is going to come down before the brick, right? Um, and the window typically goes out before the stick, but if you secure, over secure the window, the sticks go down and then the whole thing goes down. So one way or the other, you're only as strong as your weakest link. And if you, <laughs> if you have a cat five come in, all bets are off. Um, if you, if you have a cat two or a cat three come in and you have a security solution on your windows, okay, well now you've got a better chance of survival than if you didn't have a security solution on those windows. But again, <laughs> it just depends on, on, you know, many things, airborne debris. And in fact, most people don't probably know this, but the reason they call it large missile impact for um, the, the hurricane testing is because the assumption there is that a two by four is going to get dislodged from a, from a building and become airborne and travel at, I want to I say it's 50 feet per second, a nine and a half pound two by four traveling at 50 or 55 feet per second. And that can stick into a cinder block wall. Yeah. It can really, it can really do some serious damage. So that's kind of how what they're looking to, um, to to test against is like how well will the system stand up against not just the air pressure cycling, but airborne debris such as roof shingles, 
you know, clay tiles off the roof that you see in the, you know, down South, South Florida, things like that. So they're really looking to see um, how that's going to perform. Um, there was a study done after Hurricane Andrew and, um, and they looked at, you know, there was, there's all of these subdivisions, the residential houses, and there was houses just flattened. And then there's one or two houses that were still standing. And they're like, well, how did those houses still stand? And believe it or not, it's because they, they found that those houses had some sort of, of storm mitigation measure on the windows, whether it was a shutter or a security film that was properly anchored because Florida um, implemented a roof strap code. And that was because the assumption was the windows are going to blow out. When the windows blow out, the, the pressure difference from the from the outside pressure, it goes and it blows the roof off and then the walls fall down. Right. So they implemented those roof straps to stop the roof from, from blowing off. But at the end of the day, the, it, again, it's all about the weak link and the weak link is the glazing. Now, now new Florida code is impact glazing when you're in wind, windstorm areas, which is the right thing to do. Um, it, it's only a matter of time, in my opinion, before all glazing is going to be some sort of impact glazing, right? Because, you know, it's going to be impact. It's going to be probably something along the lines of, you know, what they call, which, which is, allows it to be more energy efficient on demand based on this time of the day and all that stuff. But that's probably getting a little too far down the technical um, uh, piece there. Well, you're very passionate about window gla security glazing and, and we appreciate it. You know, one of the things that I really like about security glazing is the fact that it addresses so many different risks and vulnerabilities. But another thing that it addresses, which is really becoming important for a lot of schools, universities and hospitals and other types of um, organizations is sustainability, like energy savings, uh, the social cost of carbon. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, ab absolutely. And, and energy efficiency is obviously a, it's a very big deal. And for those uh, listeners who are not aware, the Inflation Reduction Act um, that's in the Senate, I don't know if it, when, when that's when their schedule or if they voted on it or not, but the House passed it. And essentially that has close to a billion dollars in funds allocated for emerging technologies to help reduce carbon emissions and, 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 and then also uh, energy efficiency tax rebates for commercial property owners. This is a big deal, actually. Um, and so, you know, what, you know, how are you going to demonstrate or qualify for these, um, these, these uh, tax breaks? And simply put, it's you, you've got to look at the envelope, which is your your walls and your glazing. You got to look at your roofing. You got to look at your HVAC systems and, you know, your lighting. Most people have done lighting. But at the end of the day, the Department of Energy has called out window film as being one of the top five solutions with the highest chance of payback. Um, for energy efficiency and which is interesting because they tell this to schools they say go do solar film and yet they don't tell schools and schools have a, are hiring us every day to do security film that's clear that doesn't have any solar properties ah. and we're just like ah, you can do both you can really do both and and if you look at each one independently like the security like do you get a payback for security ret retrofit you hope you never do right? You hope nobody ever t tests it. Um, but the solar film one is driven entirely by payback. But, you know, it doesn't always make sense because schools have, um, and I'm picking on schools here, but schools have, you know, very a low uh, window ratio to wall, uh, window area to wall to floor area ratio. Sorry, it's been a, been a long day already. So that means they don't have that many windows, but they're, they're low and wide. Right. And when you get into office buildings that are tall and skinny, more windows, the ratio of windows to floor area is greater, thereby the chance of a greater payback is greater. Um, and so uh, th that being said, you have a lot of these new high school designs, multi-story, huge amounts of glass. And, and there's a great opportunity for dual function solar security film for a delay application. And then that is going to not only reduce heat gain, so occupant comfort, there's all kinds of studies out there about how if you improve occupant comfort, whether it's an office building or a classroom, um, you're essentially going to get more production out of your students, uh, a better learning environment, and more production out of your uh, out of your workers and your workforce. Right? I know. I When I get overheated, I get really cranky, and I would think that would prompt a lot of people to act out, being so if they can be comfortable. Oh, yeah. And, and, and behavior. It, and it wreaks havoc on your on, on your uh, energy consumption. I mean, we go into office buildings where you have individuals that have plug-in air conditioners 
and or heaters be in, in their office because the building has got a set point. And, and so the, for example, in the morning, everybody on the east side is, you know, in the summer is baking and everybody on the west is freezing in the morning. So they're cranking the heat. Everybody over here is heating. So they're cranking the AC. And that, I mean, you've got this imbalance, it's got these temperature imbalances. And so what, what the film, an applied film can do is essentially reduce temperature imbalance and allow um, mechanical systems to, to meet their set points, uh, achieve their set points more easily and not work all day. We go into in, in the office buildings that they're running the AC, they start it at midnight and they run it just to get the building cool to the set point. And then they're running it 24 seven because they can't keep up in the summertime. And you can just imagine the there's throwing dollars out the, out the window. And so there are some very good applied films. In fact, um, we were selected as finalists with the, with the GSA, um, us and 3M uh, for the green proving ground and it was for an emerging technology that is, you know, a low commercial adoption. And that is for an exterior applied solar film on dual pane glass that has no metals in it. It's a brand new construction type. And it is the highest visible light transmittance, the heat reduction ratio of any product out in the market. And it's super impressive. And the GSA is really excited about it because they have a large building stock, the largest in the world for any single building owner operator. Um, and that has dual pane windows that they don't, that the interior applied film won't perform as well. So there's a lot of new technology out there that, that is really exciting in the energy efficiency space. And again, if you're, from my perspective, if you're going to put up security film, there are virtually clear what they call spectrally select um, security films, that it's a no brainer to put those up, right? If you have east, west, or south facing exposures, if you face north, who cares? You're not going to get any sun. But, unless you're in the southern hemisphere. <laughs> unless, yeah, well, yeah, and it's in and it's in the winter time, and you got a low sun. You you can you can get some you know some some crazy exposure, but um, I, I will tell you that it's an, in my opinion it makes sense to investigate doing both. And the other thing about the the uh, solar films is they reject 100% of the UV. They reject you know up to 97% of the infrared, and so there there you can get some pretty impressive heat gain reduction numbers. And some glare reduction numbers. And so when you look at when you look at occupant comfort and you look at fading of furniture and flooring, and we I was talking to the um, uh, to the director of facilities um, over at the Cobb Gallery in Georgia because we were invited down there to go to to, to assess the glades. They have this huge west wall of glass, and, mm -hmm. uh, and he said, "Man, we're spending tens of thousands of dollars every other year on replacing carpet tiles that are faded." You know, and the energy play wasn't such a big play for them because the the facility is millions of square feet or whatever it is, right? Million square feet plus or whatever. But they've only got this one big wall of glazing. So so the, again, the ratio of glass area to floor area didn't pencil out. But from the damage to the immediate furniture in that area, it actually made sense. So there's lots of lots of benefits there that most people don't realize. Sorry. Well, you know, that. also to sustainability. Um, I know for a lot of the systems that we talk about at Campus Safety Magazine, you know, maintenance is a huge issue because, you know, you got to replace batteries or you got to update the software or, or, you know, the parts wear out. I, you know, with, with window glazing and security glazing, there, there seems to be a lot less maintenance. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, you know, one of the things that that we say about an applied system um, like window film or or uh, or even a access delay or an access denial like riot glass is their passive systems are always working, right? So unlike a security grill or something that you a lock where you have to lock it or a mechanical, um, you you run into issues with those where, you know, uh, I, I can't tell you how many people we talk to that say, you know, there was a break in and we had gates and you know, the operations staff didn't engage them at retail and it happens all the time. Um, and so with security film, it's a, it's a set it and forget it. Uh, same thing with uh, with an access denial like riot glass. <clears throat> they are set it and forget it. Once it's up, it's it's working. Then there's no maintenance and there's no worrying about whether or not Ooh, I've got to run back out there. I'll give you another example in storm. It, when, when hurricanes come through, guess what? People don't have plywood laying around in there, like, like to the side, ready to put up when a, when a hurricane comes in. Right. So what do they have to do? They have to run out or hire somebody to run out. And they're usually going to get bent over a barrel pricing because it's last minute and everybody's busy. If you can even get somebody to schedule you. And if you can even get the supply of plywood, 
So now you're, you're SOL um, when you've got exposure because you don't, you have to actively mitigate. And, and the other side of that is when you, when you drill into your storefront or your windows with these boards, you're damaging them and you're going to create leaks and you're going to create. So the, the, the idea that you have to play whack-a-mole every time you have to go out every time there's a, an incident or a threat or a storm or something like that is problematic from a cost and a, and a, and an administration and a management stamp and a logistical standpoint. Um, when you can, you can install something that is passive and always there and working. And it's a little bit more peace of mind, especially if you're, if you don't have a staffing or people uh, on site um, that are capable or qualified to, to, to react in that way. Right. Particularly during a labor shortage, like what we're experiencing currently. So very That's good right. point. Yeah. Yeah. That's what, yeah. It's, it, I mean, and, and, and it's, Look outside of the labor shortage. Look at the look at the price of lumber. How that's ballooned yeah. over the last couple of years. And so, I mean, we have we we have one client that that told us they spent two million dollars on board up over mm-hmm. co- over twenty twenty, and and it all had to come down. It was just money thrown out the windows. Two million dollars. See you later. You know. So to me, you know, there there's uh, some of our clients that are, um, like for example, our national retailer partners. You know, we, we try to, you know, we work with their construction, we work with their facilities, we work with their loss prevention and their visual merchandising. And we're working with, you know, the construction, the facilities and the loss prevention to all do the same thing. And it's like, look, guys, you're pulling from three different budgets to, to fix something that should really just be you should have a proactive posture, do it once and set it and forget. It. And they're and they're now getting to that place where they're like, we agree. Right. And I can and I can name not, not that I will, but there's multiple large global brands that everybody would recognize that, that now agree that they have to be proactive in their posture to securing their glazing because it's painful and inefficient to do it after the fact. Absolutely. Now, when we were prepping for this call, you mentioned mush markets and contr- and the contracting process. Can you talk about that a little bit? Because I'm, I, I think, I think our listeners might be interested in that. Yeah, so so when I was talking about the the mush markets, that's municipal, university, school, and hospital. <clears throat> so that's really, excuse me, that's really um, a segment um, that the performance contractors like your Honeywell, your Johns Controls, they, they service those and they package sort of deals together, or, uh, energy efficiency deals or security deal, whatever the case may be, and they finance it for those. So really, you're talking about public institutions that are that are you know, uh, starved for cash that, that want mechanisms to implement energy efficiency measures or secure or energy plus security measures without having to come out of pocket. Right. And, the, and these performance contractors are paid in their savings or the or the financing that they're doing. That's in theory, the savings are paying, <clears throat> paying for the guaranteed savings. So that's essentially what the, where we fit into the, that equation or where these retrofits can fit in is exactly what I was saying before, is when you have an, a, a K through 12 or uh, anybody in the public space that's looking at a performance contract because the federal government has mandated that, ec- I forget exactly what the percentage is, but X amount of their energy efficiency projects, call it 20 to 40%, have to go through performance contracts. They have to, that's law, hmm. right? And so if you're a federal government agency, you know, and you want to, you know, you want to act on this, this, this uh, administration goal of 50% uh, energy efficiency, <clears throat> you know, um, you know, energy consumption reduction, which is huge by 2030, 50% consumption reduction. That's a, a lofty target. Then you've got to throw everything in the kitchen sink at it. And, and where are you going to get the money to do that? You're going to go, okay, I'm just going to issue a contract for a performance contractor and I'll let them go find the savings and I'll let them finance it. Right. And so that's where, you know, we would come in and say, okay, let's look at the glazing envelope is a big piece of this DOE agrees. Um, and uh, let's find an opportunity for energy plus security, because you're a public institution, you're K through 12. Glazing is a is a pain point. It's a it's a weak spot, right. And and this is where we can kind of shoehorn in, for lack of a better word, a security retrofit under an energy efficiency provision, right. Uh, so so that's a really great um, opportunity that a lot of people don't think about. I'll give you an example. We we helped a client on, on the West Coast in California. Um, they really wanted solar film, but they had a security budget and they were on a fault line. So we sold them 
dual function solar security because the security film is a is a recommended measure to stop the glass from falling out in the, in the event of a seismic event that would twist the building and, and break the glass right so they got solar film paid for by a security budget if that makes sense so it's, it's really about looking for opportunities that you're maybe not aware of to achieve multiple goals and, and energy efficiency and security in sort of one uh bucket and then i'm sorry you asked me about something else other than the, the, the mush market the, uh, the contracting process contract which is kind of what you're talking about a little bit about as well well, so so yes and no. So that that's a that's a piece of that's a the 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 performance contracting mechanism is a its own sort of thing, right? Um, the contracting process, if we're not talking about a performance based contract or an energy efficiency contract, would be a contracting vehicle. So if you're again, if you're a public institution or you're publicly funded, then you have um, then you have to satisfy what they call Edgar compliance, which is um, which is essentially you have to demonstrate that you have competitively procured um, your 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 goods and services. So you've gone out to public bid, right? To keep, to put it simple, and um, and a lot of procurement people are afraid of their own shadow, right? They're really afraid yeah. of 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 any sense of impropriety as it relates to procurement, and and rightfully so. There's been some high profile cases where in different counties and you know whatnot that have uh, certainly here in Georgia where I live, where people have gotten in trouble for. Um, for not following those those egg, those competitive procurement guidelines, and so contracting vehicles are um, essentially a contract that's been publicly awarded, and essentially allows another public entity to what they call piggyback off of that, so that they've demonstrated that they've met the procure the, the the competitive procurement guidelines. Because look, what what public institutions and states and the federal government have recognized is, hey, if if Texas went out here and they and they publicly solicited a bid and they got the, the most responsive contractor here at this price, then why can't I just ask that contractor to do it for me and just piggyback off of that con? Then I don't have to worry about going because that's the product I want and that's the contractor I want, right? So it streamlines the procurement process in a, in a transparent and, and you know, uh, compliant way uh, that is good for everybody, quite frankly. It's good for the public. Um, I can give you examples where you know, entities did not do that, use a contracting vehicle and their bid got blown up by a protest and it and it's taken years and they still haven't got what they want. And how much money and time has that cost them? And as it relates to a security retrofit, if you need it done yesterday or you, as soon as possible, because that's security is a how fast can I get it done? You're talking about protecting people and property. Then going out to a public bid is cumbersome. It takes time and time is not your friend in security. And so these these uh, contracting vehicles are really effective in helping you get you get you know qualified contractor that has a contracting vehicle. You identify them. You basically you basically get them to provide you the pricing and the assessment. And, and that's kind of something that we do at NGS is we help our our uh, government public K through 12. Um, we help them do building assessments and surveys. No charge. We call it the frictionless process. We have this proprietary software that we use to, to provide area reports. Um, and we give them those area reports that are fully customizable, that, that show them all of the products by area, by zone, which is uh, basically what the Federal Commission on School Safety recommends that you, for building hardening is you do a zoned approach, right? So you, you can do higher risk zone one, lower risk zone two, et cetera, et cetera. And so they can kind of curate their own scope by building with this report. And it'll tell them real time what the cost is by the unit costs of those products and, and the labor services, which are on the contracting vehicles. And then they just submit that for approval, you know, you know whichever of our contracting vehicles. And then that comes out, issue a PO, we can get going right away. So it's a it's a great process. And we've assisted over 100 district wide programs since 2020 um, through one or uh, or multiple of our contracting vehicles in that fashion. Well, James, you've touched on this a little bit, but I, I'd like to, you to maybe go in a little bit more detail. How can your company, NGS, help with this whole process? Well, so we we can help by essentially um, fast tracking, getting you the uh, identifying what the scope is, right? Uh, identifying what the right product is based on what your need is. So is it delay, denial, ballistic? Um, I, you know, surveying the campus if it's a, if it's a campus or the building if it's a building providing you with that with that proprietary area report at no cost. So from start to finish, we'll, we'll evaluate the property or campus or campuses um, and then provide you 
the reporting uh, and the map essentially of all the areas, all the buildings. We provide uh, digital files that have an over, uh, basically a, a view of the floor plan and or um, emergency map. And, uh, and then the pictures of those areas and then the pricing for those areas. So it's a, a really easy, you know, you can, you can have the, the uh, another person, you, they can say, well, what is that? What am I getting for that price point on that building? You go, oh, well, let me look over here, building, you know, building A, zone one, or I want to look at all buildings zone one, that's what the price is. And that's all main entrances for all those buildings. So we essentially streamline getting, understanding what the scope is, understanding what the right product is for that scope and then what the pricing is, and then expediting that through contracting and getting it on the glass anywhere in the United States because we're licensed from coast to coast. So um, at 7,000 projects, I think we're estimating to complete this year. So we, we, you know, we're touching everywhere and um, we really are, uh, you know, an expert in this space in, you know, not just doing the install, but helping walk the clients through what the right product is, what that pricing looks like, and then how to move it through to actually get it on the glass.